So this is what I'm calling lecture zero. It's a review of mathematical background required to understand the coming lectures. We're dealing with a fairly restricted set of topics, but you have to know them in some detail. So we start with basic set notation. There are a few famous sets that we need to know. The natural numbers, the set of all numbers like that is a very important set. There's also the real numbers, which I'm sure you've seen before. This is not a course in foundations of mathematics, so we're not going to define all these things. I guess the rational numbers are also important for us. I'm not going to use them a lot, but when we do, we'll expect that you know terminology. Another important one, the empty set. That's a set that has no elements whatsoever. Now there are several ways that we can write sets. One of them is just to list all the elements. So for example, we can just use the curly braces and have the first few prime numbers like that. Or we can use what's called the set builder notation. The set of all x which belong to, that's the element of symbol, belong to the natural numbers such that uh, x is prime and x is less than 12. For example. Those are the same set, just different ways of writing it. Just jumping in for a quick note on notation here. The set builder notation we've used, for example, this, we use the colon here. Sometimes people use this vertical line, and it means exactly the same thing. You'll see both of them. And now, back to your regular video. If you have sets A and B, then the set of all things which belong to A and to B is called the intersection. And it's written like that. On the other hand, the set of all things that belong to A or B That's called the union. And remember that this or is not exclusive, right? It's okay for something to belong to A and B. It's still in this set. In other words, the union always contains the intersection. The number of elements in a finite set I'm going to just write like that. It's called the cardinality or the size of the set. We're going to write in that way. So moving on from sets to functions, if you have a set, say x, another set y, a function that takes x to y, it's written like that, is a rule which for every element of x outputs a unique element which we call f of x and that belongs to y. Okay, x is called the domain, y is called the codomain. These are both sets, and this is a rule which takes every element here to here in a unique way. It doesn't have to have a formula for it, it can be just an absolutely arbitrary rule where this matches to that, this matches to that, this matches to that with no simple formula. But of course most functions that we know do have reasonably nice formulas. It's because we can't really deal easily with arbitrary complicated ones because there's too much information involved in them. So there are some classic functions that we need to understand really well in this course. Um, for example, this squaring function 
takes natural numbers to natural numbers. Also, we could also think about it taking real numbers to real numbers. And every other power, cubes, higher powers than that, we need to understand those functions really well. We also need to understand functions that look like this. If x is a natural number, say 5, then you know what 2 to the 5 means. You've got five factors of 2, multiply them together. When x is a real number, it's a bit more complicated, requires you know, calculus to define these things properly, but we'll assume that you understand what they look like, and the graph's looking roughly like that. We also have uh, e to the x as well, where e is a specific real number, which is approximately that. Uh, that's very important for calculus because this is a function which is its own derivative. So you may remember that there are some functions which can be differentiated. Okay. Obviously, if you've never seen this before, you're not going to get an awful lot out of it, but I'm hoping that at least most people have, looking at these lectures have some familiarity with this stuff. The inverse function is the one that, if you're lucky, every element here gets hit by exactly one element over there, and you can undo it by sending the value of y here back over to the unique x. The inverse function is useful to talk about. The inverse function for this exponential function is the natural logarithm, which we're going to write like that, or sometimes just like that. We ignore the parentheses. Uh, the inverse of this one is log to the base 2, and it's sometimes written like that, but we're actually almost always going to write it just in the shorter form LG. It's very common in analysis of algorithms. That's log to the base 2, so if you see that, don't get confused. If you see log just by itself, without any base, we'll never do that in this course unless it doesn't matter. And you'll see in the first few lectures why it doesn't matter most of the time. If you want, take log here to be any fixed base that you like, and nothing that we say in the future is going to be wrong. Mathematicians tend to use e as their basis for logarithm. Some people use 10. It makes no difference, actually, to what we're going to be doing in this course. Uh, final important function the ceiling uh, and floor function, so two of them, in fact. So, this one is called the ceiling, and that's all it does is it rounds up to the nearest integer. Okay, so if you have 3.7 and you take the ceiling, you get 4. And the floor is the dual thing to that, where you round down. So there, if you had 3.7 and you take the floor function, you get 3. If you had 3, on the other hand, you would still get 3. Similarly, if you had 3 here, you would still get 3. When it's an integer to start with, nothing happens, no change, otherwise you're rounding up or down. We're going to use those quite a lot. So just a little bit more about the properties of these exponential and logarithm functions. Very important for this course that you understand exponentials and logarithms well. Some of the key properties that they have, well, we already talked briefly about some in terms of these calculus properties. So just to complete that, the derivative of the natural log, the key thing you need to know is that it's uh, 1 over x. The algebra 
of logs is extremely important. So the log, let's say we've got some base A. I do log to the base A of X, and then I do log to the base A of Y. X and Y have to be positive real numbers. You can't take a log of anything that's not positive. Uh, that simplifies, has a nice formula, and it is just this. That's just another way of writing this formula. a to the x times a to the y equals a to the x plus y. Not, it's not quite obvious. The x and the y here are really the a to the x and the a to the y over here. You start with this formula, you take logarithm of both sides, and you end up with that. Uh, so that's really crucial. If you're not familiar with that, get familiar with it before you start wading into the rest of the lectures. So if you have a function, say, from a set x to a set y, there are some basic properties that it may or may not have. One important one is what's called being one-to-one. -one. F is one-to-one -one means that if you have different elements here, they go to different elements over here. They don't get collapsed down to the same. There's nothing in the definition of function to stop them being the same. If they're not, then we say it's one-to-one. -one. One way of saying that is that if x is not equal to y, then f of x is not equal to f of y. Another way of saying that is the contrapositive of that. If f of x is equal to f of y, then x must have equal y. You could also have a property that f is onto. Being onto means that everything over here is hit by something there. In other words, for all y and y, there is some x, and x could be more than one, such that f of x equals y. Everything gets hit over here. If f is 1 to 1 and on 2, then it's called invertible has an inverse. Okay, there is some some function g from y to x which undoes f. In other words, f of g of y is equal to y for all y and g of f of x is equal to x for all x. So an important example over here is if we take x to be the real numbers and we take y to be the set of all real numbers that are strictly positive and our function is going to be, let's say, 2 to the x, e to the x, any a to the x for fixed a, an exponential function, then it turns out that that is 1 to 1 and on 2, and its inverse is given by the formula log. Okay, so in other words, 2 to the log y is equal to y and log of 2 to the x is equal to x. That's just what log means. So we're going to look at some other special types of functions which are called sequences. A sequence is just a function from the natural numbers to the real numbers. Instead of writing f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, sometimes we just write f sub 0, f sub 1. You would have seen that before, probably. 
One of the key things that we can do with these sequences is add up terms from them. So for example, f0 plus f1 plus f2 plus f3. And we will simplify our notation by using this sigma notation. And we'll write it something like that, where we have a variable, running variable i. We're summing as i goes from 0 to 3 over fi. Okay. We're going to make quite a lot of use of that. There are a couple of famous uh, sums that we need to know. We need to understand the sum of the first n positive integers. I can add in 0 as well if I like. It doesn't make any difference to the sum. That's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus, two plus n. That has the exact formula n n plus 1 over 2, which we need to remember. So another very important sum is the sum of the finite geometric series, where a is some fixed number. We're summing the powers like that. The answer is either given by this formula, if a is not equal to 1, or obviously by a different formula if a is equal to 1, because we can't divide by 0, if a is 1, all of these terms are equal to 1, and so it's obviously just n plus 1. That's how many terms we have. Now, I didn't prove the result for the arithmetic series, where the sum was n times n plus 1 over 2. You can do that yourself if you've never seen it, or use the methods we're going to show here. But for this one, I will give a proof, and I'll use a proof by induction. Okay, so let's we'll just prove the case a not equal to 1. The other one's easy. So if n equals 0, then on the left we have precisely 1. We have a to the 0. It's only one term. And on the right, we have a to the 1 minus 1 over a minus 1, which is 1. So everything works there nicely. Now we're going to suppose, suppose the formula holds for some n greater than or equal to 0. In other words, we know we're allowed to assume now that we have this same formula. I want to show it holds for n plus 1. So if I look at the sum a to the i, i equals 0 to n plus 1. That's equal to the sum i equals 0 to n of a to the i plus the very last term, which is a to the n plus 1. By the inductive hypothesis, this sum is equal to this expression. So I can substitute it. And then I add that term in there. I want to get something that looks like that, but with n replaced by n plus 1. In other words, I want a to the n plus 2 minus 1 over a minus 1. We can just put this expression over a common denominator and hope that it all works out, which it's going to, as it turns out. And you can see that when we put it over a common denominator, we get this. These terms cancel, and we get a to the n plus 2 minus 1, all over a minus 1, which is what we wanted. And so it works for n equals 0. If it works for any n, then it works for the next one. Therefore, by principle of mathematical induction, it holds for all n. And that's what we're trying to show here. n was arbitrary natural number. So that's the geometric series which we will use quite a bit.
we're going to be making a lot of use of binary trees. Now a binary tree is an object that is simply empty, having no nodes at all, or consists of a root node connected to an ordered pair of objects, each of which is themselves a binary tree, called the left and right subtrees of the root. This is not a circular definition because we can start with an empty tree and then we can build trees of size 1, where both the subtrees are empty. And then once we have that, we can build trees of size 2. And there are two of them. Etc. So we build up according to the number of nodes, systematically. In other words, we can define these recursively in a way which is not circular. So almost anything you do with a binary tree should be done recursively. Almost all algorithms on them operate recursively. For now, we don't need to look at many. There's one basic one. There are many different ways of exploring binary trees. If you want to traverse them, in other words, systematically visit every node, there's several ways of doing that. The one algorithm I want to just mention quickly now is what's called the in-order traversal. And you can think about it as a recursive algorithm that always does the left subtree, then the root, then the right subtree. So what that means is if we start here, we do all the things here before we do this one, and then we do that one. But then recursively, in order to do this tree, we do this one, then that one, then that one. So in fact, it visits them uh, from left to right some sense, the way I've drawn this. This here, then here, then it goes up there, then there. So Then it would go down there if there was a node, then it would go there, and then it would go over there. That's the in-order traversal, which we'll see later on. There are also some other traversals, but we won't need them right now. So notice that I've drawn the trees like this. These are essentially pointers, null pointers, in the programming point of view. We can think about them as pointing to different type of nodes. So we can have two different types of nodes, so-called internal nodes and external ones. And the external ones don't point anywhere. They're basically just null. And sometimes it's useful to draw them this way instead of the way I did it before. Sometimes people draw it like this. This one here would just look like that. They don't bother putting in the null pointers at all. So it's important to know which convention you're using when you discuss binary trees. Now we come to the hardest topic in this lecture, that of limits. What we're trying to do is make precise the intuitive idea that a function whose graph looks like this goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. The value of the function goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. Or the function value approaches 0. Or the function value approaches 1. We want to make this precise. So here are the formal definitions of the limits at infinity that we need. So we're writing that the limit as x tends to infinity of f of x that's the thing we're trying to discuss. We say it's equal to infinity if it gets arbitrarily large as we go far enough out. No matter what horizontal line, how high it is we draw in the graph, eventually if we go far enough out towards infinity in the x direction, we will be above that. So that's what it means for a function to tend to infinity. In other words, if I take n as a million, eventually the function will be past that and stay above that. If I take n equals a billion, I'm going to have to take x further, probably, in order to get past that. One trillion, going to have to go even further, but eventually, no matter what number I pick, eventually I can get past it and stay past it. 
So in terms of the graph, it looks like if you, if you draw this, it just zooms off up to the top right corner of your page and keeps going. Now, on the other hand, some functions could be quite small. So we say that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is zero if the values get arbitrarily close to zero. So we're talking here about in positive functions. We're doing a simple case where all our functions f have positive values. If not, we would have to consider the absolute value of the function because it might be close to zero but negative. We don't have to worry about that. We just want to say that no matter how small this value epsilon is, any epsilon whatsoever could be 10 to the minus 100, right? Could be very small. No matter how small, eventually, if we go far enough out in the x direction, the function value will be smaller than that. So what this means pictorially is that the graph of the function will approach the x-axis and eventually become indistinguishable with it when you draw it. That's what it means for a function to have a limit which is infinity or zero, but there are other possible limits. It could be like three. It could be any positive value. Suppose it's some positive number, finite. Then we say that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to L if no matter how small a band around L I choose, so from L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon, some little tiny band around there, if I go far enough out in the x direction, the function values are confined to this little band. As epsilon gets smaller, I squeeze closer and closer into that L, I will need to go further out in the x direction in order to be inside that band, but if I can always do that, then that's what it means for the limit to be L. So a couple of simple examples. The limit of x squared as x goes to infinity is infinity. It's pretty obvious to see that x squared gets as big as you like and stays out there uh, if you go sufficiently far. And the limit of 1 over x is 0. Again, 1 over x gets as close to 0 as you like. It's good to know the definition, but of course it's difficult to calculate limits just from the definition. If you think about it, for every n I've got to find some point past which something happens, and that thing will depend on n, so hopefully I can write some formula down and prove it, but if my function is complicated, it could be tricky to do algebraically. So it's nice to have some kind of rules for limits, which simplify the calculations. And the key one for our purposes is what's called L'Hopital's rule. So if you have a ratio of two things, f of x divided by g of x, it looks a bit mysterious at first sight. You want to calculate the limit of the ratio. It says you can do that by differentiating the top and the bottom. So taking the derivative of the top and bottom separately and as long as you do that and the limit exists then in fact it's equal to the original limit you wanted. So that's extremely useful. For example, suppose I want to look at the limit of e to the x over x as x goes to infinity. Then e to the x we know it's its own derivative. So I can differentiate the top, I get e to the x. I differentiate the bottom, I get 1. And so, by L'Hopital's rule, I just have to calculate the limit of e to the x. Well, we know that that's infinity. It's easy to show. e to the x is bigger than x, for example, for positive x. So, certainly, it's going to go to infinity. And notice that I could do that with higher powers. If I had e to the x over x to the 100, 
Use L'Hopital's rule once, I'm going to get the limit of e to the x over x to the 100 is e to the x over 100x to the 99. And then I can differentiate again, and again, and again, and keep going. And I always get e to the x on the top. So what that tells me is that e, the exponential function is going to go to infinity faster than any power. I can do similar things with a logarithm. Derivative of log x is 1 over x, and L'Hopital's rule gives us a nice answer. It shows that log x over x goes to 0 as x goes to infinity. One interesting thing to note, L'Hopital's rule is named after the Marquis de L'Hopital, who I believe in 1696 published a calculus textbook. This is only 30 years after calculus was invented, and it moved fairly slowly in those days, so this was probably one of the very first textbooks. And as I understand it, he didn't prove this result himself. He actually paid someone else for it. It is the case that very often uh, results are misnamed. There are a lot of results in the history of mathematics that are named after the wrong people. So that's the end of the introductory mathematics lecture, which is intended to refresh a knowledge of basic mathematical topics that we need for the lectures to come. If you've never seen a particular topic that we've gone through here, you will need to do a little bit more work. So you need to find some extra resources. Most of these things are very easily available online in many different places. So work hard on that. Keep refreshing that mathematical knowledge, and we will go straight into the algorithm analysis lectures from next time. There, we'll be using the material we talked about today fluently.